Good morning and welcome to Hurstbourne Christian Church this morning on this first Sunday of Advent. It's good to have you as part of our worshiping congregation this morning, wherever you may be. We appreciate you taking time to join our community. Uh, we hope in some way this ser service of worship will make a difference in your, your lives. You made a difference in ours being a part of our community today. So again, thank you for joining us. And let's begin our Christmas season with this first Sunday in Advent. Join with me in our opening prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you today, to celebrate this first Sunday in Advent, to celebrate the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that we have hope in a coming future, a future that is better than today because you are in it. We pray all of this in your holy name that came to us that first Christmas night. Amen. One candle is lit to remind us of our coming hope, hope that came into this world on that first Christmas day, a hope that has rested with us and stayed with us ever since. We light this first can candle to announce the coming of Christmas. Now join us as we sing together, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. You'll find the words on your screen as we sing together, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
reading with you this morning from the Gospel lesson. It's the 13th chapter of Mark, verses 32 to 37, where we hear this announcement. And about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. May the Lord bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of this, God's holy word. On April 7th in uh, 1789, the U.S. Senate created a position called doorkeeper. They appointed James L. T. Mathers to this position. And Mathers' job was to ensure that all the senators showed up and stayed in the Senate chamber, ready to do the business of the government at hand. Now, because the United States Constitution required a quorum to do business, all members needed to be present and ready when needed. At first, the Senate had difficulty establishing the, its first quorum. Their goal was, uh, was reached the day before they elected their first doorkeeper. And the doorkeeper's duty required him to make sure all the senators were alert and ready for business. And it required him to keep them doing business for the duration of the time undisturbed by others. They could not leave or check out or work crossword puzzles or whatever they're apt to do. Uh, When things got dicey and disruptive, um, the doorkeeper was there. They needed to stay the course until the decisions were made and any new paths were forged. The doorkeeper kept them present. He kept them ready and alert and willing to engage. To be a doorkeeper then meant to be vigilant, active, on task, and aware. To be a doorkeeper meant keeping those things outside, away from disturbing the swirling waters of agreement or contention within the quorum group. To be a doorkeeper meant keeping, uh, not falling asleep and not allowing anyone else to fall asleep on the doorkeeper's watch. Sometimes the doorkeeper needed to be prepared to deal with the noise and intruders and crowd control so that the Senate could continue to do its duty even during and after disruptive events. Always alert and aware, the doorkeeper is seen as the calm, friendly, face of the Senate, or a stamp of approval for the healthy disruption that goes on within the Senate chamber. Sometimes the debate within the Senate was orderly and attentive. Other times disagreements got loud and boisterous, but the quorum must remain. Oh, for a doorkeeper today. In our text from Mark's Gospel today, Jesus follows the the instruction to his disciples about the coming uh, destruction of the temple with the advice to look for signs of the difficulties to come in in establishing the kingdom of heaven. Here Jesus uses apocalyptic language and descriptions to let them know that though they will endure hardships and pain on his behalf, they will be vindicated and rewarded in the end. His advice to them then is to keep awake, to stay alert, that God will win in the end. The apocalyptic uh, language of Mark 13 about the end of the world is not the sort of thing that you want to read right before you fall asleep. It's scary. But life is scary at times, isn't it? I I don't want to ruin your day. But even if you and I are not here when history comes to an end and the stars fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies are shaken, there is much in life to fear nonetheless. With the coronavirus raging 
we don't have to think about the end of time to get ourselves in an anxious state. And so we need to deal with Mark 13. We need to confront the fact of, of dramatic upheavals that will come to us as time passes, whether it's the end of the world or, the ter- or a terrorist attack or a life-threatening disease and pandemic or whatever may come our way. So how can we predict these calamities? How can we predict the future? Here are some folks' predictions that we could surely trust. Frank Knox, U.S. Secretary of the Navy, on December 4th, 1941, said this, whatever happens, the U.S. Navy is not going to get caught napping. That was December 4th, 1941. How about this prediction? Economist Irving Fisher on October 16th, 1929, Stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau, 1929. Thomas Watson, IBM chairman in 1943, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Decca Records, rejecting request for a recording contract with a group called The Beatles in 1962. We don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on the way out. All predictions of the future. So what will the future hold? According to Jesus, some pretty nasty things, wars and earthquakes and famines, and, well, we know nasty, don't we? Can you say pandemic? Uh, We need no apocalyptic visions of flaming catastrophes to understand nasty. The question is, how do we handle nasty? None of us knows the future. I'm fond of telling the staff, and we reflect on that. We ordered this year the church planning calendar. Biggest waste of money we ever made at the church. All our staff was carrying these church planning calendars. And as the popular saying goes, if you want to give God a laugh, show him your church planning calendar. It's only prudent that we make plans and, and, and that we try to keep the schedules, but no one really knows what tomorrow will bring. It's, I think it's telling that in this 13th chapter of Mark, our master says that even he doesn't know when God will bring down the final curtain and the human experiment. Um, we read in verse 32, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, not the son, but only the father. In her book, Out of Africa, Isaac uh, Dennison tells about her, her cook, a Kenyan named uh, Kamante. And she says one night after midnight, Kamante suddenly walked into her bedroom with a hurricane lamp in his hand. He spoke to her very solemnly and said, I think that you'd better get up. I think God is coming. Isaac Dennison says that when she heard this, she did get up and asked asked her why he thought so. And he gravely led her into the dining room, uh, which looked west toward the hills. And through the windows, she saw this strange phenomenon. There was a grass fire going on out in the hills. And the grass was burning all the way up from the hilltop into the plain. And when seen from the house, she says, it made a vertical line. It did indeed look like some gigantic figure was moving and coming toward them. And she stood for a time. She looked at it while Camante watched by her side. And then she began to explain to him what was really happening. But the explanation didn't seem to make much of an impression on him. She says, he clearly... He clearly took his mission to have been fulfilled when he, when he had called her and woken her to warn her. And she said, he said, well, yes, it may be so, but I thought you'd better get up in case God was coming. Well, someday God will come. We don't know when. But of more relevance to each of us, there will come a time when God will come to us personally. Maybe you would like to know when that time will be. Most of us, I suspect, would rather not know. It would be too heavy a burden to bear. We would prefer to leave such things to God. God is in charge. There is much in life that is beyond our control, but nothing is beyond God's control. And God is our Abba, our Father, our Daddy. God loves us intimately so that why not leave things in God's hands and relax? Look, Jesus says, for the disruptive presence of God to break through 
in your current reality. We don't think God of we think of God often as being disruptive. We like to think of our in our vision of God as being a calm, serene, peaceful God who leads us beside still waters and carries our burdens. But in our scripture for today, we see also the disruptive nature of God. Not disruptive in a negative way for those who worship him, but disruptive to the forces of evil and sin, to the forces of wrongdoing and to injustice, even disruption in death. In fact, you could say that from the onset of Advent, in a sense, is a sign of the beginning of God's disruption in our ordinary world with God's extraordinary presence. The disruption of our mundane and transitory world with God's sacred and eternal promise. The disruption of our mortality with God's offer of a resurrection life. The, the truth is, God in God's very nature is disruptive. And our job is to be vigilant and look for the signs of God's disruptive presence in our lives and in our world. And then we must allow God, in fact, to, con to disrupt us and to move us into new truths and new places and new spaces. This, this is the excitement and beauty of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead our lives and to energize our church. You can always know the Holy Spirit's presence by the level of disruptiveness in our life and in our church. And if that be so, the Holy Spirit is present with us today. Let's face it, human beings are a people who like to be static. Uh, in the church, stability, safety, and status quo are feelings we like to protect and treasure. We hate to feel upended. We practically chafe at any suggestion of voluntary change or, or innovation or new ideas or new interpretations. When you come back to this sanctuary in person, you are going to be amazed. The change has taken place, some changes, out of necessity. And yet the Holy Spirit is all about stirring the waters and moving us out of our comfort zone, and sometimes with a good, strong kick. In times of trouble, when we most want to double down and hide ourselves under the covers of complacency and safety, God is most calling to us in, into the storms, calling us into the storms of, of the forces of darkness by pointing to God's present light. We are the doorkeepers of God's disruptive presence. We are the ones who can see the signs of God in the world and in the lives of people everywhere and let them know to, be, to pay attention as the Holy Spirit disrupts our spiritual slumber and ushers in extraordinary acts of love and healing, goodness and beauty that serve to counteract our fears and our pain, our complacence and our mundanity. Modernity. We are thinking that this virus, if you're thinking that this virus, this political climate we have, the divisions between people, the state of our economy, the disillusionment of our young, the sadness of our churches is winning the battle in this world then you are missing the signs of God's disruptive spirit. You are missing the readiness and the alertness that Jesus tells us is so vital to our role as disciples of Jesus in this world. Be alert, Jesus says. Stay awake, he tells us. Be ready for your mundane and ordinary lives to be disrupted by sacred and sacramental things, by extraordinary things. Be ready for your predictable life to be disrupted by unpredictable things. Be ready for your rational and realistic life to be disrupted by mysterious and fantastic things. Be ready for your easy and complacent life to be disrupted by challenging and amazing things. Be ready for your shame and guilt and sin and fear and doubt to be disrupted by a healing, redeeming power of the living and returning Christ. Be ready for your difficult life to be disrupted by the love and grace of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. We, we Be ready for your spirit to be renewed so that we can mount up on wings as eagles and proclaim the glory of the Lord in this Advent and Christmas season. Be ready because you don't want to miss the moment. 
We are God's witnesses. Be intentional about our, right? We need to be intentional about our faith. For the Holy Spirit is coming. We need to be vigilant in looking for the signs of God all around us. For strange things are coming. And God is breaking into the midst of our lives and in the middle of our world. That's the good news of Advent. That's the good news of God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. What sustains us in these dark moments is our faith. How many times have you heard it said recently, I would never have made it through without my faith? Probably more times than you can count. And in what fertile soil was that faith nurtured and grown? It was nurtured in the church. History offers no parallel to the church. When the world is out of joint, when people's minds are disordered and their hearts are failing them for fear, when it seems as though not one stone is left on the altar on top of another, then the thing of supreme importance is the living church with all of her sanctuaries of of worship and her avenues of service, the living church where men and women come to have faith strengthened and their thoughts clarified and their ideas uplifted and their convictions born and their characters created. In an age when communities of all kinds are crumbling and individualism is the prevailing ideology, only the church can offer a community that was here before any of us were born, that will be after, here after all of us die, and that binds us together one to another because it binds us to Christ. Despite our separation today, that community still exists. We are together even as we're apart. This year's Hang of the Green, I would encourage you to look it up on YouTube and, and enjoy that Hang of the Green, was quite an undertaking. Our staff decorated, and our staff did the various parts of the hanging with music interspersed. It was a hang of the green like no other. But guess what? It happened. And as you can see, the sanctuary is decorated. And as I watched our staff busily climbing ladders and crawling around on the floor and doing all those things to make the sanctuary even more beautiful, I couldn't help but thank God for a staff that was that committed to the faith they proclaim. Black Friday was quite something different too, wasn't it? Not nearly the hordes of people, way too many anyway, but how many of you shopped online instead because it was the safer thing to do. We are getting ready for Christmas, and we're getting ready in a different way this year than we normally do. We need Advent this year more than ever before. Advent is the definitive announcement about our future. Advent is the announcement of a time when Christ will return to establish His kingdom. Advent is a time of preparation for that final triumph over death and darkness. And that's why Advent is needed more than ever this year and begins with this passage from Mark. Be on guard, be alert, keep watch. Greg Fisher teach, taught a class at uh, the West African Bible College, and one day his class was discussing the second coming. Always an interesting topic. And a student asked Fisher a question that took him by surprise. The question was, what will he say when he shouts? And, and the student says, Reverend, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says that Christ will descend from heaven with a loud command. I would like to know what that command will be. And Fisher wanted to leave that question unanswered, but tell the student that we can't go past what the scripture has revealed. But his mind wandered instead to an encounter he had earlier in the day with a refugee from a Liberian uh, civil war. And the man, a high school principal, told him he was apprehended by a two-man death squad after several hours of terror, as the man described, how he would torture and kill him, he narrowly escaped the death squad. After hiding in the bush for two days, he was able to find his family and escape into a neighboring country. The escape nearly cost him his dearly because two of his children lost their lives. And the cruel, stark reality of that, that unsuspecting, undeserving uh, population had touched Fisher in that story deeply. He also saw flashbacks of the beggars that he passed every morning on his way to the office. And every day he saw how poverty destroys dignity and ro robs people of the best of what it means to be human. And sometimes, the substitute, it, it sometimes substitutes the worst of what it means to be an animal. Um, 
Fisher says even though he was haunted by the vacant eyes of people who had lost all hope, student demanded an answer. He said, Reverend, will you not give me an answer? What will Christ say? And Fisher said, enough. He will shout enough when he returns. And a look of surprise came over the student's face. He said, what do you mean, Reverend, enough? And Fisher said firmly, enough suffering, enough starvation, enough terror, enough death, enough indignity, enough lives trapped in hopelessness, enough sickness, enough disease, enough time, enough. Indeed, Desmond Tutu, Bishop Desmond Tutu, once spoke of his own struggle with life and with God. He recalled his favorite cartoon, a picture of God standing at an open filing cabinet, and open files are strewn all around the filing cabinet, and God is in obvious despair. His head is in his hand, and the caption says, Oh no, I seem to have lost my copy of the divine plan. Well, God hasn't lost his copy of the divine plan. And God's plan is still in effect. God is in charge of how and when time will end. And God is in charge of our lives. And God will provide our needs regardless of what may come. God's plan is that there will come a time when suffering and death and despair will be taken away. Enough. God has not mislaid God's plan. Whatever comes our way, we can trust God for our future because God is in control. Robert Louis Stevenson once put it this way, the stars shine over the mountains, the stars shine over the sea, the stars look up to a mighty God, the stars look down to me. The stars shall last for a million years, a million years in a day, but God and I will live and love when the stars have passed away. No one knows what the future may bring. But we do know who holds the future. That one is our loving God. God is in control. God, my friend, is in control. If you watched our hangings of the green service, 
you would have found out that I love Christmas. I love decorating for Christmas. I love Christmas trees. I love Advent wreaths, and I love wreaths like the one behind me. I love the manger, too. I love all of the joy and celebration that comes with each part of the, Christ, Christ, uh, of the Christmas tradition. But I've always found it a little difficult to translate back to the table during Christmas. It's hard to think of the manger like we have before us with a little baby born in a stable and then bring that baby into adulthood and see it suffer on the cross. But I think that's what makes the suffering and the joy so meaningful. The ability to see what happens after this humble birth, the suffering that came at Calvary. Because we've all felt suffering in our lives. We've all felt pain. And when we have that joy, when we see that Christmas tree, it reminds us of the coming peace, of the hope we have in the future. So no matter where you are in your journey with Christ, I invite you to come to this table, even though it may not be physically with you, but come to the table in your own home and celebrate that sacrifice with us today. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and having blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a like manner, after supper, he took the cup. And having blessed it, he poured it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, given to you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, please allow your presence to come into these elements today. Allow them to fill the elements both here and wherever we may be. Allow us to have that presence inside you and to feel that joy and hope which you give. In your son's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me.
here at Hurstborn Christian Church for our live stream service. We trust that in some way, some part of this service lifted you and made your day a little lighter as a result of being with us. We remind you to come be with us too uh, next week and remind you if this service did touch you in some way to share it with a friend. Would you bow with me now silently and we'll close with our benediction. Now may the grace, the peace, the joy, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ go with each and every one of us sustaining us and disturbing us. Amen.